Hi there. I'm here today to talk about event sourcing, and this is a follow-up talk to a talk that Andreas Bernauer gave at Bob 2016, and it is about the same application and some of the insights we gained from it. I'm CEO of Active Group. We do software project development, uh, doing functional programming almost exclusively, and we also provide training and consulting, and of course, we also organize this conference that you're at. Now, this is a throwback to the year 2015 when a client approached us that was running a large number of auto service shops of so-called service centers, uh, running mostly diagnostics. So clients would drive their car to the service center. They would drive it onto one of several lanes that you can see here. And then uh, various diagnostics would be run. Now, at the end of each lane is, uh, I guess, what you would call a Davenport desk that would contain various pieces of equipment. So there's a PC. Um, there's a printer, there's various pieces of diagnostics equipment hooked up to the PC that you could then hook up to the car to run those diagnostics. Now, in 2015, the company shifted IT policy and they removed all the PCs from the downport desks and replaced them by mobile devices. And the mobile devices, well, they belong to the employees now and they would carry them around as they move between lanes, as they move from service center to service center or sometimes even to a client site uh, you know, carrying a suitcase full of diagnostics equipment. And that uh, presented a technical problem because, of course, you know, as one, you know, as an employee would move from one lane to another, they would want their mobile device to be hooked up to the diagnostics equipment that's there, and the printer that's there. Uh, and so various pieces of, of configuration change would have to be performed. That was, uh, you know, hook up the right printer. And you know, it was especially cumbersome with uh, some wireless pieces of equipment where uh, configuration involved manually entering a MAC address that was printed in tiny print on the back of the mobile device. So we were tasked with writing an application that would just reconfigure the mobile device automatically as somebody would move it from one lane to another. And uh, we ended up creating a software that looks like this. So here's uh, the main screen that would pop up whenever um, well, whenever you would push a button or whenever the mobile device would uh, enter a Wi-Fi of another service center. So it would identify the service center from the Wi-Fi, uh, give you a choice of lane, and you would just have to push one button and then the application goes away quietly and uh, you know, performs the necessary configuration and uh, people can get on with their work. Now, as you can imagine, it's not just an issue of configuring each mobile device automatically. So here's the configuration screen where you could say for a particular lane what pieces of equipment that exist there. Uh, we would also like, you know, if somebody configured a printer to be the printer of a particular lane, we would want that configuration to be available at all the mobile devices automatically. Uh, you know, it would be unrealistic to expect, you know, 1,500 mobile devices to be configured for each of the lanes that were in the system and for each service center. So ideally, configuration would somehow be communicated from one mobile device to another. Now, naively, one would assume, well, just put the configuration information on a server um, and just retrieve it from the server as somebody would change lanes. Unfortunately, that didn't really work out. Uh, as you can imagine, in an auto shop, the Wi-Fi is not always very reliable. There was limited bandwidth between sites or from a site to a possible site of a server. And, Anyway, they did not have the administrative capacity to run it at, at a server anyway. So we really had to do without that. So we needed to establish a decentralized solution uh, using peer-to-peer -peer synchronization. So the idea was we would perform configuration on one, one, one mobile device and that would just be synchronized to the other mobile devices. And we simplified it to just having that happen on a pairwise basis. So mobile devices would kind of encounter each other in the network either by you know, triggered either by a new piece of configuration data being available or by just a mobile device being turned on or entering the Wi-Fi of a service center. And then again, periodically, to just make sure that everything is synced up um, and is reasonably current. Now, um, I guess as you'll learn in the next talk, uh, it's non-trivial to just have a database that stores state um, and have that be distributed. So if you would just have a database that stored, you know, this is the printer at that lane, uh, and then you would synchronize, um, you know, it might be that might be the case that two mobile devices disagree on what printer is current at a certain lane. Uh, and then you have to use, you know, fancy gymnastics with CRDTs or consensus algorithms or something like that 
uh, to converge on some kind of agreement on what the printer is. Um, so we decided instead to use a different strategy for um, storing configuration information. Instead of storing state, we would store facts, what we were thinking of. That's how we were thinking about the problem in 2015. So, you know, state is, you know, this is the printer at that lane. And the fact is, you know, Mike Sprover told the system that this was the printer at that lane on that day at that time, um, you know, possibly uh, including other uh, log information. And this fact will remain a fact for forever, essentially. It might be that there is another fact later or, you know, different, you know, different place uh, that complements that, you know, the printer breaks, somebody else comes along and tells the system, well, now the printer um, uh, is that, and then you just store that, that other person told the system that the printer is now an HP or an Epson or something like that. So, and again, that, that other fact would also remain a fact forever. So essentially the database would just accumulate an ever growing set of facts. And this greatly simpl simplifies the synchronization problem between two mobile devices, because you just have to make sure that whatever facts are on one mobile device just need to be communicated to the other mobile device and uh, the other way around, so like that. And ideally, you know, especially given the flakiness of the network, that would happen without transferring the entire set of facts uh, to the mobile device. So you would kind of restrict that synchronization process to whatever wasn't on the other side. Um, I guess you could view that as a CRDT. Again, the next talk will give more um, information on that. Um, so, you know, in CRDT lingo, uh, what we are doing is we're using G sets. So, so a set where the only operation that we're performing is we're unioning um, two sets and these trivially form a lattice and you can use that then as the basis for a CRDT based synchronization algorithm. But um, really you can, do, uh, you can do this a little bit more directly now. Um, so here in the software is the interface that we established. This was written in F sharp. So, um, uh, so we just established an interface between the actual um, database management for the database of facts and the synchronization algorithm. And uh, as you can see, uh, you know, communicates hash codes. We'll get to why that is in just a moment. Uh, it, it includes uh, serialization. It includes, um, uh, it includes functions for both retrieving uh, the data blocks in the system and for uh, writing them back. And, um, you know, this interface was, was pretty good at decoupling the synchronization algorithm from the actual facts database, which was also necessary because these two things were developed very much independently uh, at the time being even in different time zone, one Canada, one Germany. Um, and well, using that interface, you can implement synchronization algorithm uh, based on what's called Merkle trees. I guess that's the basis for most efficient synchronization algorithms. And I'll, uh, Andreas ran over that in 2016. I'll just recap briefly. So a Merkle tree works, well, at the bottom, you see the level that says data, that's the blocks of data, each, each, uh, each block of data representing a fact. And what you do is you organize them in this Merkle tree data structure um, as follows. So you put a tree on top of these data blocks where the path from the root of the tree to the data block is something, uh, is essentially the hash code of that data block or some bits from the hash code anyway. So if you know the hash code, you know where to go from the root of the tree down to the data block um, that you're looking for. Moreover, at the interior nodes of the tree, you store a composite hash code. So uh, the nodes immediately above the data block would just have the hash code of that data block. And then you would concatenate those um, one level up and, uh, uh, and rehash them to put another hash code at the interior node that identifies the data blocks underneath. And that would mean that the top node contains the hash code that identifies all the data blocks in the system. So if you're just, so what the software would do is, which is broadcast periodically, you know, here I'm, I'm a mobile device in this network. Uh, you know, here's my top hash code, uh, top hash code in the Merkle tree. And all other devices would see that and compare it with their own top hash code. And if they were the same, no further action was necessary. And only if they differed, you would have to actually execute the synchronization algorithm. And um, so the way that I imagine that synchronization algorithm is kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen Japanese business people exchanging business cards and they have this kind of cool move where they exchange them simultaneously. It looks very elegant. And uh, this is also how that synchronization algorithm works. 
So the top hashes do not agree. You go one level down and you exchange the hashes at the next level and you identify those uh, that are the same. Those you just throw out because you're the same. Um, and that means all the data blocks underneath are already synchronized and all, the, all those that differ you keep in the loop as you go down the Merkle tree, uh, always kind of widening, uh, going to a new level of hashes, uh, throwing out those hashes that are the same and keeping those that are different. And that will very quickly identify um, the data blocks that differ on both sides that you then need to communicate to the other sides. Um, and all in all, this, uh, this system had turned out to have a lot of advantages, some of which we didn't even anticipate. So one that turned out to be very important, I recommend doing that in any software where you can do that, uh, is there's an audit log. So if, uh, you know, if something's wrong with the system, with the, um, with the configuration information, you can track in the system uh, you know, how and when that happened and who did it. And uh, that quickly identifies um, problems and where problems uh, originated. Also, that synchronization, because it happens automatically and because the default mode of operation for the software is offline, um, it feels like magic to people. So you don't have to push a button for the synchronization. It just happens. Um, and people kind of in hushed tones in the hallway say, oh, it's a virus. Uh, and they kind of think that's cool. Uh, no, they're fine with me. Also, <laughs> there's this funny phenomenon that the CIO who drives between the service centers also has a mobile device. And whenever he drives onto a parking lot, it would synchronize with the devices there and kind of bring data from far away, right? Synchronization would only happen locally within a service center. But of course, as a mobile device travels from one service center to another, it brings all that configuration information uh, with it. So people would notice and say, oh, there's a service center we didn't know about previously. You know, the boss must have driven onto the parking lot. So, um, well, fine with me also. Um, here's a brief review of the implementation, of course, using functional programming and again being an F sharp. So we just create a data structure uh, for a node and a Merkle tree called Merkle tree. That's, this is the Merkle tree type. Uh, the path based on the hash code that leads from the root to each uh, block, we call that the signature. And each node is identified by the prefix of that signature leading to that interior node. And then uh, underneath that node is a list of data blocks identified by their hashes and their full signatures. And um, we then use what's called a fingerprint, which is one of the interior hashes um, uh, for, as the basis for synchronization, which is, again, just the signature prefix and the hash um, at that particular interior node. And then, um, you know, based on that um, uh, you know, business card strategy, um, the two uh, mobile devices would send each other messages and the message would e either be, you know, I've got a bunch of fingerprints for you at the current level. Here it is. Um, you know, compare them with your own. Um, or the algorithm would reach the bottom of the Merkle tree and then just communicate a set of blocks. And so each synchronization step uh, is implemented by this pure function. This is the actual production code. So you give it uh, the set of all the hashes. You give it a set of Merkle trees and you get give it a message that came from the other side. And you emit uh, as a return value either a new message to give to the other side for the next round and another Merkle tree set or a list of hashes of data blocks that then need to be transferred. And you can then implement on the basis of that, just implement um, various um, uh, synchronization algorithms e either locally for testing purposes over the network using whatever files, any communication mechanism you can think of. Uh, the great beauty of having this done um, in a functional language, of course. Um, here's another aspect that's not uh, particularly relevant for this talk, but it's still, um, uh, I, I still find it pleasant is that this makes it, having this be a pure function makes it extremely easy to test uh, using property-based testing, using uh, quick check. Uh, and here is the central property, which just says, well, if you have two sets of blocks, BS1 and BS2, and you run the synchronization algorithm yielding two new sets of blocks to be transferred to the other side, BS1 prime and BS2 prime, then, well, you have two conditions, right? The blocks that you get and the blocks that you have should be intersection free, saying that the algorithm is efficient, doesn't transfer uh, blocks needlessly. And moreover, the union of, this, of the blocks that you have and the blocks that you get should just be the total set of blocks um, between these two mobile devices. And um, this has been the central test in the system and it, uh, so far as we know, eradicated 
all the bugs uh, in the synchronization algorithm uh, before even the first um, deployment. And it's been in deployment for a couple of years now, so we think uh, we're good on that count. Now, uh, especially if you're thinking about CRVTs, you might have noticed that just exchanging sets of facts is not enough because those facts are facts about state. They're statements about state. And of course, those statements uh, could conflict or they could, you know, they can't be true. Um, uh, they, they, they can't make the same statement about, uh, about the state um, at a given time. So for example, uh, here you have the situation where you have two statements from two different people making conflicting statements of, about what the current printer is at um, a certain length, what we call a place. Now, you might think that this would be rare in reality because people, you know, our assumption is certainly was and is that people would mostly configure a printer while they're standing next to it and therefore notice if somebody, you know, says no, you know, would configure a different printer. But in practice, this happened often enough to really require um, explicit handling. We still don't know why that is, but I guess this is just the general wisdom about distributed system systems as well as a distributed system, and you can't expect people, things to line up perfectly. Now, uh, the facts database is perfectly capable of representing um, this information. So there's an inter internal type here that says, well, if you're asking, for example, what is the printer at that place, it might e either say that information is absent, no printer is configured, it might say we're good, so there's unanimous agreement on what the printer is, or there might be a conflict uh, that specifies different printers um, there. And so the problem of synchronization or of having, uh, having agreement on the state kind of gets pushed up to the application level. And I think that's actually the case in a lot of applications. You should do that. Uh, but of course, your mileage might vary on your own project. So in the beginning, we figured, well, it's kind of important whether it's that printer or this printer. So we would present the user with uh, a modal dialogue saying, well, you got to choose what is the current printer now. Unfortunately, we didn't think this through properly at the time. Um, and what happened is because our synchronization was so efficient, when a conflict would appear, it would appear on all the mobile devices at a service center simultaneously. So a screen would pop up for everybody. Everybody would kind of go, whoa. What happened now and say well you got to say what the printer is at that uh, particular lane um, and um, first of all it would irritate the users and would it would interrupt their flow of work moreover um, you know there's this thing here where uh, you know the facts database we'll get back to that later also would track dependencies between these facts so you know somebody sees the fact that somebody configured the printer to be what we, you know, the Epson FX80 at some point in the past. And if they then configure the new printer, you know, that fact essentially supersedes the previous one, right? So you don't need the previous one to uh, infer what the current state of the system um, is. So, so we'll track those dependencies. And now the problem is that, well, first of all, um, uh, you know, everybody would be presented with that choice uh, manually, and we quickly fixed that problem to not interrupt the flow of users. We automated the merge process and would create those merge nodes that you see uh, at the bottom there, the merge fact. Unfortunately, once we automated it, we didn't count on the fact that, again, synchronization would kick in, would transfer the merge nodes to the other mobile devices, and then there'd be multiple merge nodes uh, that would, again, then have to be merged, and so the system would automatically churn out merge node after merge node. And so we quickly had to turn off the system then. That was the only major glitch, I think, that we made in deployment. Um, and then we had to switch strategies again. So now what the system does, when there's multiple facts uh, about a given piece of state, it will just arbitrarily but deterministically choose one of them and get on with business. It would not create a merge fact. It would just leave the conflict um, in place in the database. Now, when a user would come along and be unhappy with the state of the system for whatever reason, and, conf and you know configure a new printer, then a merge fact would be created that supersedes all the previous facts that were in the system at the time. And this basically made the entire conflict resolution issue go away completely. Now, uh, the, one of the problems with pure facts databases is, well, you need to find out what the current state is. And um, specifically, you know, one problem is somebody drives their uh, mobile device onto the parking lot and logs into the Wi-Fi, and then it needs to infer from that what the service center is. And we figured just looking through all the facts for all the service centers and looking for a matching subnet address, uh, that's just going to be too slow. So we put 
what's called a locality map into the database. So we used uh, SQLite, still use SQLite um, for storing those facts. And we just put an additional table that would map the Wi-Fi subnet to um, the, what we call the locality, the service center that the Wi-Fi is associated with. And, um, but for some reason, probably associated with uh, the synchronization, we were not quite sure, this locality map would get out of sync. There were bugs in the code that we couldn't quite figure out. And so, um, especially because there was pressure, it was, uh, it was inhibiting the correct operation of the system, we needed to put in a quick fix, so we just took out the locality map and uh, implemented that expensive lookup going through uh, uh, larger parts of the database. And here's the change that we made, discontinue the locality map. Um, and to our surprise, the code was plenty fast enough. We shouldn't have implemented that locality map in the first place. And this way we were able to remove a bunch of code. Always good in a software project. Um, so, you know, all this was made possible by a very simple database schema. I don't think we need to look at all the details, but you can see it's just a regular good old SQL database stored in SQLite. That is essentially a key value hash. Um, um, and the hashes are associated with either localities, um, uh, service centers, or places, lanes, um, and, um, and what, store, what store property values. Now, you can see in that first table that um, it says, well, there, there's a hash identifying a fact, and it, it might obsolete another fact that is in the system. And the database tracks that dependency, as we saw in that graph earlier. And we can use that to just create a database view that omits all the facts that have been obsoleted by newer facts, giving us just a clean view on a relational database of all the facts that are relevant in the system currently. And so, so that's the set of facts. But of course, this is kind of hard to process directly when you want to figure out the current state of something. Uh, so the system itself, which is use a domain object to represent a locality, as you can see here. So there's a locality object. It stores a list of all the places, uh, it associates a subnet, uh, associates a server, you know, all the stuff that is relevant. And uh, of course, it's a very different representation, but then there's a function that would just go through the relevant facts and uh, build that domain object um, from those facts. And then we could go on and perform configuration. Um, now, uh, when it comes to changing configuration, uh, I mean, you saw that red screen earlier that the user would see to you know, change the printer or do something like that. The way we implemented that is, uh, well, it's a, functional, uh, it's a functional system written in F-sharp, and so and the locality data type is immutable. So as the user makes changes, you create a new locality object. And in order to then um, both store the object and also present the user with what's going on, we would just take that new object and the old object and uh, do a diff on them, a locality change description, uh, create a list of those. We could display them into the user. We could display them to the user. And we could also use this as a basis for a bunch of database operations that you see there uh, that would then add the relevant facts to the database. And we didn't know it at the time, but uh, our client came back later and said, well, quite often we want to undo a change, right? We, did, we screwed up. Uh, configured the wrong printer, uh, something went wrong, and uh, therefore we want to go back in time. And now this is one of those things that's kind of hard to do if you have a traditional CRUD data warehouse um, sitting somewhere, even if um, you know, your transaction history is, is stored somewhere. But with this, um, it was really easy. So we put in what we call the time machine uh, that just displays a list of the changes that were made to the system for a particular service center. You can just click on one of them, click a button, and it, will, um, and it will go back to that state. Actually, it won't go back to that state. It will create a new state with a bunch of facts um, that is just equivalent to the old one. How do we do that? Well, um, uh, so here's, uh, here's the set of facts that are in the system. We would just extract all the facts that were associated with one particular oops, uh, locality. Here it is. Um, and uh, create a new virtual database, an in-memory database containing just those facts. And if the user wanted to go back in time, we would just throw out a bunch of the latest facts. And on the basis of that, we would just use the existing functionality to extract a domain object, a locality object, create diff using uh, the existing functionality, 
uh, and creating then the database operations uh, that are needed to update uh, our facts database. And so we could just put together the pieces of software that were already in place in a, in a new way to implement that new functionality. So that was really a pleasant exercise um, and really, um, really showcased you know, the architectural properties of the system. Now, uh, at the time in 2015, we weren't aware that uh, event sourcing existed as, as a term or as a community or as a set of techniques. So this is all stuff that we made up. But I think it's worthwhile now to compare it with uh, what is generally you know, the folk wisdom in, um, in event sourcing. And if you look at that, you will often find um, a, a pattern called CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Separation. And here I have a diagram from Martin Fowler's blog post on, the, um, on that. And the idea here is that you, well, well, there's a database, but then you have two different models. And by two different models, typically what that is is two different databases or two different database tables might also be in memory, but often it's really, it really is uh, different database tables. And the idea is that you have separate models, one that processes incoming requests for change, so-called commands, and puts that in the database. And then there's another model, the query model, that is used for answering questions uh, for executing queries. So that's why it's called the query model um, and, and give that back to the UI. And you make those things completely separate. And uh, well, that's how the responsibility is separated between uh, uh, acting on commands and answering queries. Quite often you will also find as terminology uh, the distinction between a read model and a write model, referring to the same distinction that you see here uh, in the diagram. And I always found that confusing. I mean, of course, the UI reads from the read model, but of course, the read model also needs to be written to so that it has current information. And I just found it an unnecessarily rigid and strange way to think about uh, the architecture of an event source system. And if you look at the system that we built, it really works different, right? It, it actually, the read model and the write model, which is the locality uh, domain model that you saw, is the same. Those are not different. Um, and uh, from that, we generate new facts to put into the database. That would, be, I guess, be the command level. And uh, questions get answered, um, creating a new locality object um, as, as we're answering questions. Now, um, of course, that might not always be efficient. So we saw that in the case of the locality map, uh, it, w it turned out to be efficient uh, to answer just on the basis of the facts database. But that might not always be the case. And you might want to create a bunch of caches. And that's, I think, a much more useful way to think about this, right? As you think about, oh, uh, you, 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 you think about keeping your facts database updated, and then you think about the queries, the questions that you're asking, and what the best way, the most efficient way to answer those questions is. And the most efficient way might be to just look at the facts database. An efficient way might be to create another table in the database. An efficient way might be to just add an index to the database. That's, that was the case with the locality map, for example. Um, so all kinds of things that you might do, and then do uh, you know apply your general knowledge on how to organize databases on implementing um, the best way to answer those questions. And uh, don't worry about that responsibility separation thing, which I haven't found to be useful. So uh, I should wrap up. Uh, store facts, not state. Uh, that's been the case for us for a large uh, variety of projects. That really, it's a good idea to do some variant, uh, some variant of event sourcing. You should. Um, uh, you should at least try to avoid having uh, unnecessary projections or read models through the use of explicit dependencies between the facts or to or indexing, right? And that will ensure that your query model, whatever you call it, your cache, uh, well, if it's not there, it can't go out of date. You should, that's a general piece of advice, always separate your data model from the DB model. I mean, we could have implemented a lot of functionality by just poking in the facts database and you know, answering individual questions, but we answer questions through that domain model that you saw earlier, thereby decoupling the facts model from the domain model. And that decoupling then enabled us, for example, to implement the time machine that you saw earlier. Uh, speaking of time machines, actually make that time machine, right? It, uh, chances are it will provide useful functionality to your users. Um, as I said, I didn't really find uh, CQRS to be a useful principle organizing an event source system. You should really just think about the questions you want answered and maybe caches or databases that help you answer those questions and don't worry about that responsibility thing. Um, 
all of these things serve to uh, serve an architectural goal, which is to decouple different parts of your system. And that is always a good idea, even if you think your system is not going to live that long. So um, here's my general architectural recommendation. Decouple all the things. Uh, thank you. Enjoy Bob.